Yes. Ha ha. Hello, hikers. I hope you hike. Ale. Otherwise, you can become a hiker by watching this video and being totally intrigued by the hiking world. But uh, <laughs> this is my intro, let's go. So as promised, I am making a video with information on the Massive Trail. The Massive Trail is a trail I did last summer. It's in Norway, it's very beautiful. I cannot recommend it enough, just go. But if you're watching this video, you probably already know all that. So I won't get into detail, don't worry. I will just get started. So as with any long distance hike, actually the most important thing to know is what gear to take. I already made a video on this. I dissected my whole pack setup and uh, everything that I took with me on trail. So if you want to know that, just click here, here. I'm going to do this thing where you can immediately go to a video and I will also link it in the description down below. So a couple of days ago, I asked on the community tab of my channel to give me all your questions on a massive trail. So all the stuff you wanted to know to make sure that I would cover everything that you need to know on this trail. I made a list of five tips from me to you and 10 questions that you guys asked me that I will answer right now. With that, I hope you will know everything you need to know about this trail. The first tip that I have for you for this trail is to become a member of the DNT. The DNT is the Norske Turistforening. It's basically a community in Norway that takes care of the huts that you will pass on the trail. Also, they also take care of the trail. So any bridges that you see, any wooden planks that are on the ground to avoid stepping in mud, all that maintenance is done by the DNT. So even if there wouldn't be any advantages to having the membership, it would still be nice to support it because you're gonna use the stuff that they provide. However, it comes with an advantage on trail and that is that you get a reduction on stuff that you buy in the huts. So if you wanna sleep in the huts, if you wanna get breakfast, food, anything, dinner in the huts, or if you wanna buy thermal pants, sometimes they have it. Uh, you get a reduction on it if you're a member and you support the DNT through it. So, I mean, just become a member and you're part of the club. Yeah. Second tip I have for you is to buy a key of the huts. On the trail, you have two types of huts that you will pass. You have the serviced huts and you have the self-served huts. So the serviced huts, they have a host, they have people in there that take care of the food, of the beds, of the maintenance of the hut of all that. It's actually a little hotel in the mountains. But then you also have the self-served huts and the self-served huts have no one in them, except for you and maybe other hikers that pass the hut that night. Don't worry, they still have beds. They still have sometimes a kitchen, sometimes a shower, really nice. And they have a little pantry as well with sometimes some dried food. I will go more into detail on this later in this video. They're a private house in the mountains, I would say, but you need a key for it. This key is really easy to get. Uh, I will link it down in the description below as well. You can order it online and they will send it to your house. Easy. And now I have a key for life. I can open the huts in Norway when I'm 60 years old. <laughs> I feel so powerful when I hold the key. I'm gonna show you the key. Wait, 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 wait. This is the key. You should buy it. This key. Third tip I have for you is to download some apps onto your phone. I have three of them. First one is ur.no. It's written yr.no. And what is it? It is the weather forecast app of Norway. I found it to be more accurate than <laughs> the weather app on an iPhone. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> It's still, you're in the mountains, you cannot really know, but it gives you an indication. And also if there's no reception, you cannot get the weather forecast. Then you have to ask in the huts or you just look at what you've loaded like a couple of days prior to know what the weather forecast is. The second app that you can get is Hüttebetaling. So the lovely system of the self-served huts is like 
mind-blowing to me. If you are in a self-served hut, you can get some food that they have in the hut there. You can sleep in a bed, you can, voila, you can get all these things that you actually need to pay for. But I mean, you don't really want to carry cash on trail. It's actually my fifth tip, spoiler alert, my fifth tip is don't take cash because you can pay everything by cart or by Hüttebetaling. If you pass by a self-served hut and you get all these things that you actually need to pay for, you can do that through this app. You just link your credit card, you select all that you took in a certain hut and you pay for it afterwards when you have phone reception on trail. Very easy and I just love the system. The third app that you can get is the DNT Midlem app. Nothing much to say, it's just a certificate that you are a member of the DNT. So if a host asks you for proof that you are a member of the DNT, you can just show them this app. Voila, it shows them that you're a member of the DNT. Voila. The fourth tip that I have for you is to not buy insect repellent in Norway. Buy it beforehand in your own country because Norway has this law that companies cannot put any substances um, that hurt your body in products that are used for the body. So that means that insect repellents in Norway don't contain DEET and DEET is what you need. <laughs> DEET is what you need, uh, but DEET is what you need when you really want to repel mosquitoes and other insects. So buy it in your home country and be free for mosquitoes on trail. Free. And then my fifth and final tip before I get to the questions and like the really informational part of this video. I already said it, don't take cash. You don't need cash. I didn't use a single coin of cash in Norway. Okay, first part is done. Da -da 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 -da. Welcome to the second part of this video, which is the Q&A. Are you ready for the Q? And slay. First question I got, how to get to the trail. I hiked the trail from south to north, which means that I started in Höglisäter, which is not that far from Oslo. So to get there, I just took a bus from Oslo. I actually just used Google Maps, typed in Höglisäter and it just gave me the bus that I needed and it was right. I paid on the bus. Some people actually reserve a spot in the bus beforehand. Actually, I would say maybe do it. Maybe do it. I was alone, so I just need one place. But still, if the bus is full, the bus is full. It's about 100 euros for this bus drive, so keep that in mind. But voila, it just gets you straight from Oslo to Höglisäter. So to get to the beginning of the trail, easy. To, <laughs> you hear me coming, you hear me coming. To get back from Sotaseter to Oslo is a bit more complicated. At the time when I arrived in Sotaseter, the bus stop there wasn't served. A couple that was staying in Sotaseter that had a car was so nice to give me a ride to the nearest bus stop. So I first took this ride to the first bus stop and then I took three buses to get to the airport of Oslo and then one bus to get to Oslo, Oslo. I would say it's about a day travel, like maybe 10 hours and you need to get onto several buses. The nice part about it is that it's a beautiful ride. So to get back to Oslo, I actually also used Google Maps. Google Maps is pretty accurate with public transport in Norway. If you want to buy tickets for the buses or the trains in Norway, you can do that through the app that's called vu.no. And it's basically just a public transport app and you can buy tickets there. That's handy. Second question. <laughs> Where to find information on the trail? The DNT have a website and they have a brief summary of this trail. It's actually, I would say it's everything you need to know. And with this video, you will be totally informed. It's actually everything you need to know. However, I also already touched on this in my gear video. I wanted to have something on paper with me on trail. I didn't want to depend on all this digital stuff. If all electronics would fail, I would still have something with me. So I made a little booklet myself, just in Microsoft Word. Let me show you, actually. I have it here, oops. Ba -ba -da -ba -ba this is a little booklet. It has an overview of the trail. It has like all the day hikes of the trail. 
some sudokus in the back if you're bored. If you want to use this as well, feel free to download it in the Google Drive link down below. It's in Dutch. It's not perfect. I made it before I did the trail and I didn't do any adjustments on it. Also, I like literally Google translated some Norwegian stuff to Dutch. So <laughs> if you're Dutch speaking or Flemish speaking, it zijn niet altijd de beste zinsconstructies, maar je gaat het wel begrijpen. All right, so that's the booklet. Feel free to download it. Boom. Haha. <laughs> the third question that's actually the biggest question that i also had before i did the trail is where you can resupply it's not easy it's not easy to resupply on this trail so let's go over it can you resupply in the service huts a little bit some have dried meals most of them have bars but sometimes their stock is low they don't have anything so i wouldn't count on it then you have the self-served huts they mostly have a pantry and there you can resupply however in theory these pantries can be empty so i think the best thing to do is to ask hikers that come from the other direction that have seen the huts that have seen the pantries to just ask them hey how much food do they have in this hut but in theory, you cannot really rely on the huts. Either the serviced huts or either the self-served huts. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to tell you this news. What I did is I took a rest day in Finse because it was stormy, it was cold, it was very heavy. But on my rest day, I took a little trip by train to Yailo. In Yailo, they have adventure stores. So there I went to an adventure store and I bought all these dried meals for the next coming days. And I also just went to the supermarket, got a lot of bars, Snickers, Twixes, everything that I wanted to get, some soup, blah, 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 blah. I did a full resupply there, but you have to take a train from Finse to Yailo to do that. Another place where you can do a full resupply is one that I didn't use, but some hikers that I met did that. It's called Tuin Cruset and it is, haha, it is between Sulebu and Sletningsbu. So there you can get off trail, you can take another trail and you can pass by Tuin Cruset and there you have a store where you can do a full on resupply. It's a pretty tough hike to do this in one day to get to Sulebu to Sletningsbu bypassing through Tuin Cruset, but I mean a lot of hikers do it because it's the only resupply point that where you can like do a full on resupply. Summary, to increase it, maybe take a rest day in Finse, go to Yailo, or check the self-served huts, or oh, the serviced huts, but I wouldn't count on that. However, you can always get a meal at a serviced hut. You have breakfast, lunch, dinner, if you really wouldn't have any food, you can eat in the surfaced huts, but it's pretty expensive. So, I mean, if you're rich, <laughs> why not? I couldn't do that. <laughs> Fourth question is if there is phone reception on trail. So the answer is yes and no. It's not like the Kungsleden that you have a big bottom part that mostly has phone reception and a top part that doesn't have phone reception at all. It's more like one time you have phone reception the other time you don't. Some huts do have Wi-Fi. It's indicated in my uh, in my booklet and it's also indicated on the DNT website. So you can check on that to like know which huts have Wi-Fi. That's the answer. Really short. Yes and no. <laughs> Fifth question is how to do the glacier crossing. The glacier. Ah! The glacier. The glacier day is I think one of the most beautiful days of my life because the hike after the glacier for me like more up north was beautiful the weather was good and the glacier crossing was magical it's easy it's easy so the glacier is somewhere up north it's next to Fanarokken. so if you come from the north it's just before Fanarokken. if you come from the south it's just after Fanarokken. so what you do is you get to the hut just before the glacier and you just tell the host hey I want to cross the glacier tomorrow. They will tell you, yo, be there at that hour and we will provide crampons and all the stuff you need for the glacier crossings. Can you do it with trail runners? You can. I just had trail runners. I put the crampons on my trail runners and it was okay. And then just enjoy the ride. It's beautiful. Ah, it's, ah. Oh, 
it was so beautiful. I also was so lucky that on the day that I wanted to cross, there were only two other people who wanted to cross, which meant we had two guides for three people in total. So we took a little detour and we watched, we watched like a beautiful part of the glacier. I wish you all that you have this experience as well because it was beautiful. It's also not physically demanding not more physically demanding than any other part of the trail, so you will be fine. Sixth question. Do you need spikes and an ice pick on trail? Technically, you only need it on the glacier, but there is a lot of snow on trail. I went, I also went in a summer that had a lot of snow, so normally it's not as snowy as when I went. And I was wearing trail runners, and I would say if I didn't have my hiking poles, oh, I wouldn't have had a nice time on trail because there's a lot of snow, and with trail runners, it's way more slippery than uh, with hiking boots. I saw people do the trail with hiking boots and without poles, so it's possible. And I did it with trail runners and poles, totally possible. I think there's like two places on trail where I did think like, whoa, guys, maybe like a rope wouldn't be unnecessary on this part, but I wouldn't take spikes or an ice pick or anything like that for the whole trail. It's not, it's not necessary. There are just a couple of parts with snow that you need to pay extra attention for. Good news, you don't need it. Which leads me kind of to the next question, and that is, do you wear trail runners or Gore-Tex boots on this trip? I wore trail runners, basically because I'm a big fan of them. They're really lightweight. They are not these heavy blocks on your feet that you need to carry around, but there's a lot of mud on trail and some snow. So after a couple of days, I was in peace that, <laughs> I also was in pieces, but I, <laughs> I also was in peace with the fact that my shoes were gonna get wet every day on trail. And after I made that click in my head, it was totally fine. Do you need Gore-Tex boots for this? I don't think so. If you want or need extra support on your ankle, or if you don't want to slip as much, or if you want your feet to be a little bit more dry, then you want to go for Gore-Tex boots because there are a lot of stones on trail, so your feet do this the whole time. I actually had a hard time the first few days because I wasn't, I was a bit too nonchalant with where I placed my feet and I was wearing trail runners, so my ankles hurt a bit after a couple of days. If you don't want to pay much attention to this, you want to have Gore-Tex boots. But I mean, I managed with trail runners. I saw other people wearing trail runners and I mean, it's okay. But you wouldn't be a fool if you wore Gore-Tex boots to this trail. I wouldn't think you're stupid. Question eight is, can you section hike the trail? Answer really short, yes, you can. So the trail runs through four national parks and at every end of the national park, there is either a road or a train station or a train station and a road. The first national park from south to north you're gonna pass runs from Hoeklizeter to Finse. Hoeklizeter has a road that you can get to by bus and Finse has a road and a train station. Finse is very reachable. The second national park runs from Finse, that has bus, train, car, whatever, to Sletningsbu. Sletningsbu is in the mountains, has no road, but close to Sletningsbu is Tuinkruset, which is this resupply point, and that is next to a road. I think maybe it has a bus station as well, so you can go there and start the trail from there. Or you can go to Skarfheim, and Skarfheim is a little bit before, it's a little bit more south, and Skarfheim is next to a road as well. I don't know if it has a bus station, it definitely has a road, so you can reach it by car, maybe you can hitchhike, or voila, do something like that. The third national park runs from Sletningsbu, which you can reach through to Inkruset, to Sognefjellshutta, and Sognefjellshutta has a road, I think there's a bus station and obviously you can hitchhike there or take a car if you have a car and like you want to do a little circle. Voila, you can uh, you can do that. It has a road. And then from Sönjefjell Suta you go to Suta Seter and Suta Seter has a bus station and a road. So to summarize, you have Högli Seter, you have Finse, you have Skarfheim, you have Tuinkruset, which is between which is close to Sletningsbu 
And then you have Sonja Fjellshutta and Sota Setter. So, voila! You can section hike the trail pretty easily. We are almost there. Ninth question is if the trail is expensive. <sighs> I actually, I'm not gonna lie. I would say it's expensive. Maybe I just don't have much money, but it's expensive. Norway is known to be an expensive country, even to the people who live there. They're like, yes, life is very expensive here. They're not like these very rich people who, who can go to these expensive restaurants all the time. But on the trail, yes, I would say the food that you're gonna buy, the meals that sometimes you're gonna get at the huts or the stays that you're gonna pay for in the huts, public transport, a hotel room in Oslo, it's all expensive. <laughs> Yay! You can really lower the costs by sleeping in your tent always and by cooking your food yourself and that's what I mostly did. But I mean, sometimes you just want to have a meal. Sometimes you just want to have a bed. You have to pay for public transport. You're gonna pay, you're gonna pay, you're gonna pay a lot. So for me on trail, I did a little saving up before I went there because I knew that it was gonna be expensive. So I had some savings that I could spend on trail, so I wasn't really like, oh my God, I cannot spend any money. So I was like, Ali, I can pay for a bed here. I can have dinner here or ba 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 So I would say my spendings are average, maybe average too high. Meh, no. <laughs> No, I still slept a lot in my tent and uh, no, 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 no. So including a hotel room in Oslo, a dormitory room in Oslo at the end of the trip, public transport to get to the trail, to get back from the trail, food, all the food that I bought on trail, a night in a hut, a night in a self-served hut, a sleeping bag liner because I bought that on trail and also a thermal pants because I bought those on trail. So basic costs and here and there like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I spent a thousand euros. I spent a thousand euros for three weeks. With inflation, ça va. I still think like, whoa, it's the most expensive uh, holiday I ever had. Definitely you can do it way more cheap. Way, 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 way cheaper. If you don't have any meals in the huts, if you don't, if you always sleep in your tent, if you maybe even sleep like around Oslo on a campsite or somewhere, definitely you will be able to do it cheaper. But voila, that's what I spent. Information. It's just information that I give you. And then we have the final question, which is, Flor, would you recommend northbounding or southbounding? So if you're not familiar with the terms, northbounding is hiking to the north, so from south to north. Southbounding is hiking from north to south. I did it northbound, so I hiked south to north and I would recommend that. But I mean, mm, also I always hike from south to north. The sun is not in your face. With every trail I did so far, the hardest part was in the north, with this trail as well. So I started off a little easier in Hardanger Vida, which is mainly flat, mainly very easy. And then gradually it became harder until the final stages of the trail. It also becomes, in my opinion, more beautiful. With more beautiful, I mean more dramatic. The landscapes in the north are more dramatic with more mountains, with more drama nature. And I like that, that it builds up because then the south is like, whoa, oh my God, I'm in nature. It's still very beautiful. Eh? And it even becomes more beautiful the more you go up north. Also, a lot of people hike it from north to south. So you're more alone on trail because you just pass these people. You don't see these people every day again in the hut, which is sometimes a curse, sometimes a blessing. <laughs> I mean, some people you just don't want to see again, <laughs> especially like weird men. Oh, for example, at the end of my trip, when I reached the north, I saw some people starting the massive trail and their first stages, which for me were my last two stages, were very hard. Whoa, I could see them struggle. And everybody that I, that I met, previously on the trail were telling me that they they that they had the hardest time in these first two stages but because for me it was the final stages and i already hiked a lot it was okay 
it was so fun. So voila, in terms of beauty, in terms of difficulty, in terms of sun in your face or in your neck, I would do it northbound. Ah, that's it. Those are my tips. Those are your questions answered. Again, if you want to know what gear I took, I have a video on that. If you want to see the trail, I have a video on that. I can keep talking, but I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to say bye. Bye!